Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Cho. I'm a neurointensivist and a physician scientist at the University of Pittsburgh. I appreciate this opportunity to talk, talk to you about intracerebral hemorrhage and the brain-body connection. This is my disclosure slide. I have no relevant disclosures except uh, research funding. So spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. First and foremost, I want to present this and, and make it clear that this is a syndrome and not a single disease. There are many, many different etiologies that can go into what eventually becomes a spontaneous intraparenchymal hemorrhage. One of the common etiologies is cerebral amyloid angiopathy, a protein deposition in cerebral vessels that make them brittle and prone to breaking, causing micro and macro hemorrhages, a process related to aging and neurodegeneration. Another very common process is hypertension, chronic hypertension leading to lipohyalinosis of the small cerebral arterioles and leading to the formation of Charcot-Bouchard aneurysms and eventually these aneurysms breaking in the typical locations such as the subcortical gray and white matter, the brainstem and the posterior fossa leading to intracerebral hemorrhage. There are smattering of vascular etiologies as well. Thrombosis of the cerebral venous system um, can lead to venous infarcts, cerebral edema, and bleeding. In this top panel, you can see a thrombus in the superior sagittal sinus and the company intracerebral hemorrhage. Classic vascular malformations like the arterial venous malformation or even a rupture of a cerebral aneurysm, which typically puts blood in the subarachnoid space, but can sometimes bleed direct into the brain parenchyma and give you an intraparenchymal hematoma. And finally, cerebral cavernous malformation, sometimes benign, sometimes can cause important hemorrhages. And these are just some of the many etiologies of spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. As a syndrome, however, hemorrhagic stroke or intracerebral hemorrhage is still the deadliest form of stroke. And to date, there are no known treatments that, that would improve ICH outcome. It's not for lack of trying. We've over, for over decades, we've tried various different things to try to reduce the damage and improve the outcome. One of the major approaches is slowing down the bleeding. The thought is the bigger the hematoma, the more the mortality and the morbidity, and let's see if we can make it smaller by improving hemostasis. So from the FAST trial where we tested recombinant activated factor seven infusion to the TIC trial where we look at tranexamic acid, both of these successfully reduced the growth of the intracerebral hem hematoma. Patients ended up with smaller hemorrhages, but unfortunately, they did not reduce death or severe disability at 90 days. Most recently, we had the PATCH trial where we gave pla platelet transfusion to patients who were on antiplatelet therapy, um, and the outcome was actually worse in the group that received platelet transfusions. So that did not work. But what if we remove the blood clot, the offending agent, the, the, the agent that is causing the mass effect in the cerebral edema? We've done a lot of that as well. The original STITCH trial compared open craniotomy and hematoma evacuation to medical management. Unfortunately, uh, did not see any benefit in outcome at six months. But there may have been a trend that the hematomas that are closer to the skull, the more superficial ones, may, be, may have a benefit, and hence STITCH STITCH 2 was designed and to specifically look at patients with superficial ICH. Unfortunately, in this case, we also did not see reduced death and disability. In clear IVH3, we investigated um, the use of intrathecal administration of TPA to lyse and drain out the intraventricular blood because this is one of the strongest predictors of port outcome and death in intracerebral hemorrhage. And after um, many years and, um, and three trials, um, what we found is that this treatment paradigm significantly reduced the amount of blood in the ventricles. The ventricles cleared up nicely, but unfortunately, despite radiographic improvement, there was no difference in functional outcome at six months. We then moved into minimally invasive technology. So MISTI-3 um, is a protocol where an image-guided catheter is placed directly into the hematoma and TPA is delivered into that catheter to lyse away and drain out the hematoma with a small burr hole. And results were released in 2018. Once again, we were able to reduce hematoma size. We were able to reduce death, but unfortunately not able to reduce 
severe disability. So the, the group shift shifted from dead to severely disabled and not shifting the group of patients who made good functional outcome. Finally, ENRICH is another minimally invasive approach to hematoma evacuation using image-guided technique. This study is still ongoing and we're waiting uh, for the results to be released. We also looked into reducing iron toxicity using deferoxamine. A phase two go-no-go -no -go study was conducted and results released in 2018. Um, unfortunately, once again, um, in this case, even though there was no harm, um, the benefit did not pass the futility test and a phase three is not indicated because of the small effect in, um, in benefit. So reducing blood, getting the blood clot faster, reducing iron toxicity, all of this didn't work. What is it that we're missing? I should start by saying that this is not uncommon in the quest for neuroprotection, and this is not unique in intracerebral hemorrhage. We went through years of this with, intra, with ischemic stroke, with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and similarly with traumatic brain injury. It seems that when it comes to protecting the brain, there is something more than just improving the imaging outcome. And we can talk about wrong, wrong dose, wrong timing, wrong patient subgroup, um, but ultimately I think the brain is a, is a very complex organ. But additionally, what I want to bring to everybody's attention here is up until now, I've been showing you only images of the brain and only slices of the brain. Ultimately, these are patients who are critically ill, who are in our intensive care unit, many of whom are intubated and probably have other organ system dysfunction or failure. And uh, what about the brain-body interaction? How does that total system, a total human disease, affect the final outcome? And have we really studied this? So a quick word on the systemic immune response to brain injury. There is actually a lot of this. Acutely after brain injury, we all see that there's a leukocytosis, there's a surge in pro-inflammatory cytokines, and this happens within hours. In several diseases, initial leukocytosis is an independent predictor of brain injury severity and also of poor outcome. Um, many of these patients develop systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Then a day or two later, there is a subacute immunosuppression, and this is less well known. Um, a lot of these patients develop a lymphopenia, and I encourage everyone in the audience, when you go back to your intensive care units, take a look at your brain injured patients, take a look at their lymphocyte count. You may be surprised to find how many patients develop a subsequent lympho lymphopenia. On the laboratory side, these patients also have reduced functional activity of their monocytes and an increase in the anti-inflammatory cytokines. Their lymphocytes apoptose and die, and most importantly, their spleens shrink, which, I will get, which I'll get to in the next slide. Not surprisingly, this immunosuppression puts these patients at high risk for infection. And not surprisingly, patients with more severe brain injuries have more infections. From a laboratory standpoint, it's those people who have a reduced number of CD4 lymphocyte counts and higher plasma, plasma IL-6 and IL-10 levels. So the shrinkage of spleen was initially found as a, as, as a surprise result experimentally when um, investigators were inducing stroke in rodent models and just by accident noticed that all of the rodents who had real stroke um, had a much smaller spleen compared to the animals who just had sham surgery. So the splenic shrinkage is not from a systemic re response to the surgery itself, but it seems specific to the brain injury. And the same thing happens to their thymus. We do not have the time in this short talk to get into the, the immunobiology of the brain-spleen interaction, but I will tell you that once this phenomenon was first noticed in rodents, we then went to look for them in humans, and boy, did we find them. This is pretty well documented now in ischemic stroke, where patients go through a splenic contraction after acute ischemic stroke, and that is associated with lymphopenia and the reduction of various lymphocyte subpopulations, and that is then being linked to stroke outcome and also infect infection risk. There's less data on intracerebral hemorrhage, but it is emerging now. In this table alone, you can see a couple of prospective and one retrospective study documenting that after intracerebral hemorrhage, patients, human patients do undergo splenic contraction, and the more the the more severe the ICH is, the bigger the hematoma is, 
often the more severe the splenic contraction is. And the, the smaller the spleen, also the lower the lymphocyte count. In fact, the whole notion of a central nervous system injury induced immunosuppression is not, not necessarily a new concept. We've known that there are various connections between the central nervous system and our peripheral immune system through the sympathetic nervous system, through the, the, the hippocampal pituitary axis, and through the vagus nerve, through effectors such as catecholam catecholamines and glucocorticoids. And the spleen and thymus is an important organ in this connection. But ultimately, in a macroscopic patient level, what does this mean? This means that in our critically ill patients with a severe brain bleed, we go into a vicious cycle where the severe brain bleed puts the, patient, puts the patient's body in a dysregulated pro-inflammatory process with systemic inflammatory response syndrome, but also simultaneously an immunosuppressed state, a little bit similar to what we're seeing in sepsis. Um, and except in this case, the origin is a single brain injury. This peripheral immunosuppression then leads to additional infections in this patient population, nosocomial infections, which then further drive the pro-inflammatory process, which can then go in and further compound the brain injury. Um, one of the things that can travel reasonably easily in and out of the, the, the blood-brain barrier are these immunocytes and um, they do play an important role in secondary brain injury and likely potentiate brain injury when there's systemic inflammation. There is now emerging data and people are beginning to look at this brain-body interaction. Many groups, including my own here at the University of Pittsburgh, in this paper published in the Neurocritical Care Journal, um, a patient, the investigators looked at a subpopulation of patients with ICH and found that at least 20% has intracerebral hemorrhage has, has SIRS, and um, if you have SIRS alone, your odds of having a poor functional outcome is significantly increased even if we adjust for all the other predictors of ICH outcome. If you have SIRS and an infection on top of that, this odds is further, further compounded, suggesting that there's some sort of systemic brain interaction that ultimately drives the outcome of these patients. What exactly is this interaction and how does it really work? I'm not able to tell you that here because this is an active area and a new area of investigation. Um, investigators like myself and many other, many respected colleagues are just beginning to look at this complex interplay between the inflammation and, and tissue destruction happening on the brain side of the blood-brain barrier and what is happening on the systemic side, including the shrinkage of your spleen, the changes in the lymphocyte subpopulation and the interplay between systemic inflammatory response and all the super infections that we experience in a critically ill patient in an intensive care unit. But we hope that this new way of looking at intracerebral hemorrhage and finally thinking about intracerebral hemorrhage as a total body disease and not a brain disease alone will help us open up new, rev new avenues to find a new therapeutic that may one day help us improve the outcome of intracerebral hemorrhage patients. With that, I thank you.